My next guest can be seen leading her group of three men on Team Iron Cowboy on Amazon's original series, World's Toughest Race, which premiered on Amazon Prime on August 14th, 2020. She is a six-time Kona Ironman World Championship qualifier and competitor, has participated in 18 Ironman competitions, and has tackled so many more undergoing a life-affirming transformation, taking her from an average stay-at-home mom to a top Ironman triathlete with nothing but passion, drive, and determination. Please welcome to the Living Instead podcast, Sonia Wick. Hi, Sonia. Hi, I'm so stoked to be here today. Thank you for having me. Oh my goodness, I am so happy that you're here. So we have something in common. We have both been on TV shows. I was on NBC's Songland, but you were just on The World's Toughest Race. Yes, yeah, 10 episodes on Amazon Prime. I'm still like, whoa, from it. <laughs> yeah, so the first episode has, or did all 10 episodes go live? All 10, it's bingeable. <gasps> you can binge it. Oh my I gosh, gotta love you can it. Yes, because then you don't have to wait to see how they played out your story. You don't have to wait week after week to see how it's going to get edited. The editing was amazing. They did such a great job. I'm so <laughs> excited for people to go watch this show because you have such yeah. a testimony and amazing story. How did that Thank opportunity you. come about, by the way? Did they reach out to you? or No. The, the race was a thing 17 years ago. Like mm -hmm. Mark Burnett, who produced The Survivor and The Voice, this was his start. That was his first Emmy. It was Eco Challenge. And he did six races in like the late 90s, early 2000s, and they were on the Discovery Channel. So a lot of us like watched that when we were young going, what is that? And remembering it. Well, 17 years later, he reboots it with Bear Grylls. And I just saw a call for applications. And it was like, Eco Challenge is back. We're taking applications. And then they had a little video with it. And I've never done an adventure race, but at the end of the video, it said, this is the race that eats Iron Man for breakfast. And I was like, oh, this looks crazy. I remember it when I was young. Why don't I get a team of Iron Man athletes together who have never done anything like this? And we'll see, like, does it eat us for breakfast? Can we make it through? We didn't know. So yeah, I just saw the call for applications and, and went for it. It's amazing. Well, let's rewind all okay. the way back before this amazing opportunity. What was that moment for you that you realized you had this amazing drive in yourself and this passion and this fire to go out and compete in these pushing yourself to the limits kind of races? I don't even really like identify as that, yeah. as having this drive. I've always been really outdoorsy. Okay. And I've always loved running and being active and the way that it made me feel and the adrenaline always made me feel more solid, more myself. I've always loved being in the outdoors and going on adventures, even when it was like climbing trees when I was little. I'm an only child, so I spent a lot of time alone and I go off on these mini adventures in my neighborhood to not get in trouble, but like find new fun, cool things. So I think I've always had this adventurous attitude. Mm -hmm. But we grow up in life, it's hard for us to keep believing in ourselves throughout all of it. So I think exercise and running and biking and backpacking or hiking, but it just felt good doing. It didn't seem like a big thing to me. It just seemed like home. Absolutely. So it was always a constant thing in your life. Was there a moment where it went from, I really enjoy doing this. Oh, you know what? Maybe I should start competing. Yeah. And what was that switch for you? Yeah, I, I took a hiatus. I went to college and then I went to graduate school and then I got a job and I bought a house and I had a kit. Like I did the things. <laughs> you lived life. You, you, did the, you did all the, the things thing. that they say I you did. I did the things. I did marriage, check. You know, yes. house, check. Like two cars in the garage, check. Okay, get pregnant, have the baby, check. And we were living it. And I had decided to stay home with Annie after she was born. And um, I had a really hard time with those first years. She was a really challenging baby and took me to my limits. Poor little thing. She didn't mean to be, but it was really rough. And I started feeling like I was losing myself. And I remember one day and I was gaining a lot of weight to have the baby. And then I still had the weight, which our body does this, like it's miraculous. But I remember looking in the mirror one day and looking at the woman and saying, I consider myself this really outdoorsy, adventurous, athletic woman, but I don't see her. Like I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm like, where did she go? Because the woman I'm seeing in the mirror is sad, tired, not taking care of herself, gaining a lot of weight, which is fine. That's part of life. But it, all the things weren't adding up to who I self-identified as. And that was sort of the moment that I was like, we got to rewind. We got to make a change. I need to do something. And I dug my husband's mountain bike out of the garage. He's six foot four. 
I'm five foot six and I put the seat all the way down and bought one of those kid trailers, you know, and hooked it up to the mountain bike. And I just started riding this bike around with my daughter in and we go to the library and we go to the store and it was like, oh, I'm, I'm an athlete. Like I can do this with my, with my daughter. And then I put her in the, the jogger and then we go for a little jog. And I thought, okay, I'm starting to feel like myself again. I started leading some hikes with other moms with babies. And I was like, okay, this adventurous girl, she's coming back. She's coming back. And I thought, well, I do the, I'm doing the biking. I'm doing the running, but I don't know how to swim. I, I didn't learn growing up. I could doggy paddle, but I, I couldn't do strokes or anything. And so I thought, well, if I took some swim lessons, you know, A, that gave me a little time for myself and I get to put my daughter in daycare for an hour, take a swim lesson, and then maybe I could sign up for a triathlon. And that was it. I, I went through those steps, just looking for adventure, looking for a little bit more of myself, did my first triathlon and had a blast. Just felt more like myself than I ever had. I had fun. I felt like I was good at it like it could get better. And from that point on, I have the personality that's just like, okay, 100%, let's go. Then it spawned a whole triathlon career before I even got into this whole adventure racing stuff. But first, yeah, I was a triathlete for about 10 years and racing tons of Ironmans and trying to qualify for the world championships and just kind of up-leveling my game every year that I could. Wow. How long did it take you to learn to swim at 27? I did my first sprint triathlon nine months after I started taking swim lessons. That's amazing. Yes. And I have this great picture of getting out of the water, which, I mean, it was like, I was scared. I wouldn't be able to survive. Like I had swam the distance. So I knew I could go the distance in the pool, but now I'm in a lake and that's different. And I made it through and I was getting out of the, that very first swim. So relieved that I was still alive. And next to me was this woman that was probably eight months pregnant. <laughs> Oh and I remember goodness. just looking over at her being like, who are you? Like, I just survived. I have a great picture and I, I look at it often. It makes me laugh. That's amazing. It's interesting. I see my journey and your journey, completely different circumstances, but as Some far as feelings uh, and emotions. Yeah. Yeah. As far as like the artist's journey, it's, it's so similar because you really are at the end of the day competing against yourself and, and becoming yes. better for you and yes. trying to write the best music you have to and, 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 and get out and do the best shows that you can do. When I was 24, 25, and I'd been on the road for about three years at that point, and I just felt like I had lost myself. And I don't yeah. know what happened. I was doing what I loved, just like you. Obviously, you love being a mom. Like there, I did. There, there yes. are parts of you that you love doing, but yes. there's a really big part and a piece missing that That's right. I just couldn't quite figure out what it was. And just like you, I would look in the mirror and I realized I was giving myself such horrible feedback and that voice of like, you're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not this enough, blah, 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 yep. blah. Yep. And I know <laughs> making that decision, regardless of whatever journey you're on and, and the circumstances, making that decision to just stop and say, wait a minute, there's something off here. Yep. And, and actually how it seems very trite and simple, but how much work actually goes into, okay, well, you know what? I'm just going to throw myself into all these different things to see if I can find me again. It's difficult. It's scary. And it's hard. I mean, just like you for swimming, yep. I can't believe it. It's amazing. Yep. You literally can let what lights you up guide you. I think I realized if it seems fun and it looks fun, go for it. Give it a try because the motivation will start to come from the inside. If it's the right avenue for you and for someone, right, that might be performing for another person, it might be racing for another person, it might be painting, but there's going to be an ease to it that makes you want to do the work required to be good at it. And if that's not there, if it's a push, push, push to do the work required to be good at it, there's so many things in life. Like, please go find something else. Please go join a rock climbing gym. Please go take a sculpting class. Something that you're just like, oh, I always wanted to, kind of scared, but oh, that would be so neat. That would be so fun. Those are our guides. We're really uniquely incentivized in that way, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, take me back to the moment. So you've decided you're going to go find yourself again. You've got this brand new baby, a loving husband. <laughs> You're starting, you're starting to dabble in these races. What, what were the hardships during those times? Because you just said so beautifully, it's, 
the light inside of us, that will guide you, but there's always going to be hardships. It's being able to keep that love alive and have the love and the light on the other side as you're going through those hardships. So how did you get yourself through those moments? It's like a million different little things. Some of it is that shift in perspective and awareness. Sometimes your brain is talking nice enough for you to know that the pain that comes to you in your life is meant for you. It's meant for you to overcome and get awareness on the other side. There isn't a timeline. Some pain might take years. Some pain might be over by the afternoon. But owning the hardships that are presented to us, the roadblocks, the stumbling blocks, they're meant for us. We want life to be easy. We want things to be easy. And sometimes it is, and you get to go in a direction of easy. But when the roadblocks come, yeah, it's meant for you too. And so feeling it, going there, allowing, that's really what's going to help you progress through the maze of those quicker. But there were times that I did not do that well. You know, I really fight that struggle of the internal battle of the brain with, do people like me? Am I giving my best? Some perfectionist tendencies, some definite low-level anxiety. All of this was really part of my journey, constant questioning if I was good enough or if I was enough. And sometimes sport it gives you a a win or a podium or something like that. And it appeases that side of yourself that doesn't believe you're enough, but only for a little while. And so there is this tendency when we're achieving things, and I would assume your industry is very similar. There's always the next awesome performance to be had. And, And then there's like the next morning and you're, you're usually feeling a little bit empty and there's two ways you can kind of go with it, right? Like most, the way that people go with it is like, Oh, let's go find that feeling again. Like, let's go sign up for another race. Let's go book another something. Let's keep chasing and letting that feeling of achievement be your jumping block, your stepping stone along life. And that started to get old for me because I had to keep up leveling. I hated, like the Iron Man wasn't enough. Now we had to win the Iron Man. Okay, winning the Iron Man wasn't enough. Now we got to win Kona. Now we got to like, okay, we got second in Kona. And I remember waking up the day after getting second in the Ironman World Championships. I'm at the top level of the sport as an amateur. I'm the second fastest 35 to 39 year old in the world. And you get this beautiful umiki bowl on the podium as your award. And I woke up the next morning, I looked over at the nightstand and I saw the bowl, the bowl I had been really going after for like five years. And my first thought was that thing is empty. They don't give it to you full. They give it to you. It's empty. And so, so do I, I feel empty. And that was when I knew I had gotten second. And that was the moment I knew like, do not go chase first because that bowl is empty too. I saw last night, the girl got that bowl too. And it was empty. That was really the biggest moment for me is I'm thinking about this wrong. Instead of using these achievements as a stepping stone to stepping stone to stepping stone to make me feel good and enough and worthy and accomplished, I had to find something a lot deeper within to be motivated by, grounded by, grounded into. And that was really the biggest challenge of my, of my life. Like that journey was a was quite a lengthy process because I didn't really know where to start. Mm. Mm. And what was that when you, when you finally found that inner peace or that inner comfort? How do you describe yeah. that feeling? For me, it's God. I feel like I, I plug back into my source. I'm only a light if I plug back into my source, right? You're right. Yeah, see, you got it early on. I had a very intense spiritual shift these last two years. So for me, it's like, oh man, I'm late to the party, but everybody has their own journey. They have their own journey and it comes to you at the time that you need it. That's what happened to me. So I took a foray through, no, no, not spirituality. That's not the lesson. The lesson is that I need to serve. So I kind of did it all backwards. Instead Mm -hmm. of going spirituality to serve, serve to achieve, I was going achieve. "Hmm, That doesn't work. Let's serve. Serve. That doesn't work. Let's try spirituality. (laughs) Oh my gosh. But that's the beauty of spirituality. It'll just come to you the way it's supposed to. Yeah. Eventually it's going to get there. So yeah, I took a foray from like achieving. Then I went into business trying to build and expand a big coaching company with a lot of uh, female coaches and athletes. And we were thriving, but I was dying. I was Mm -hmm. overworking myself. And because I wasn't tapped into that core and that groundedness and that you are enoughness, you are held. I call it the vertical instead of the horizontal. So that's what we run, run around on earth. But what's the vertical? I'm still yeah, that. The business failed. I, and I failed as a leader because I couldn't emotionally handle 
all of the attacks to my ego when I would make a change or when people would be unhappy or a coach would be unhappy or something. Everything started to get me and overwhelm me at times. So my foray into serving really ended with it taking me down emotionally, mentally. I had a breakdown, really bad panic attack. And so then I had to rebuild from that place, like a really broken, failed business, depression place. And so I think it's just how my journey was supposed to go. We had to keep pulling away the layers of the onion until there was a very, just the cord was left. And that was when I said, okay, I better open myself up to there being a bigger purpose. I always could chase something else as my purpose. And I finally had to say, no, what's my divine purpose? And once I got to that place, things moved a lot quicker. <laughs> mm. Once I opened myself up to the reality that we're not the space suit, like we're the dude in the space suit on this earth. And we're not just our body and our brain in connection, running around, achieving things. Like there's, a, there's another core center that has to be that guiding light. And then once that happened, boy, now things are opening up for me in the reverse. Like I'm now able to serve in a different way and achievements are coming to me in an organic way instead of the backwards way. Mm -hmm. And almost like the inauthentic, the icky way where it doesn't feel like anything you try on fits right. It kind of feels like hustling, like you're yes. hustling for your okayness. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. If I just win that next race or if I just yeah. do what my manager yes. says and check all the boxes. Yes. And, and If I check all the boxes, somehow I'll be okay. Like I'll get the things and the things will work out and I'll be okay. But even the minute one thing works out, then the minute after that works out, you're like, still not okay again. Yeah. I remember playing the Bluebird here, which is an iconic place in Nashville. And yeah. And I know you understand this feeling in a different way because I've also experienced the same feeling when I ran my first half marathon and crossing the oh. finish line. It was just okay. like this high, this performance yes. high. Mm -hmm. And I get that when I perform and I was yep. playing at the Bluebird, all these people were there. It's very intimate and a pretty spiritual and heavy experience if you lean into it because so many greats have been at the Bluebird Cafe and played at the Bluebird Cafe. But I remember playing and then leaving and coming home and I live alone and I just remember shutting the door and putting my guitar down and being like, I feel empty. It's such a real thing regardless of wherever you're at in your life. And I was like, you know what? I just played the Bluebird, the, the place. I think that's when it happens. Yeah. I think that's the gift of getting to the pinnacle is that you get to find out that it didn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> right. And you get to reinvent the way you do things. Absolutely. And it's, it's a tough process, but it's so important. Yep. Well, and it's, it, it's important to talk about it too. It's what we're doing today. I feel really moved to talk about this in this way for people to listen to here and just let it, let it get in your brain a little bit. And for those who are listening, if you resonate at all, there's a reason you're hearing this because it's a common human experience that I think sometimes people run away from because yeah. it is scary because change and unknown and all of that is totally, absolutely terrifying. But that's the truth. Is the pain of changing greater than the pain of staying the same. Yep. And to those people, I'd say, just keep achieving. Like, you'll get there. Yeah. Eventually, you'll get everything you wanted and realize you didn't want it. So if you're not there yet, sign up for another race. Go book another gig. Like, yeah. you'll find it. Yes, it's coming. it'll happen the way it's supposed to. Yeah, yeah. No just rush. Like, I just kept booking shows and I kept playing shows and I kept just <laughs> on the wheel, you know? And then at yeah. some point, it just starts to... You know, I mean, for what I believe, the spirit, God, he just creeps in and is like, hey, knock, knock, knock. Yeah. You know, I exist. There's a bigger purpose. It's the, going back to what you said, we're not just people running around, achieving things, making money, and then you die. There's so much more color and vastness in this world. Well, so let's go to your journey with depression, because I know that the show talks about that a lot. Was it emotional watching all of it back and hearing yourself talk about your journey? We're featured in episodes one and two. Mm -hmm. They open up our team. And then in episode two, I, I have a bit of a meltdown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that part was hard to see. My team, Captain James, said something to the effect of, when Sonia's down, it gets all of us down. So we got to get her back up. 
And that's hard. That's always hard to hear that you're, you're in a place of struggle and you're affecting other people, which people who struggle don't want to affect other people. So that's, that's hard and shameful. I think being able to view the show in the way that it was edited gives you a bit of perspective on it. It's not really a cringeworthy moment, but there's a bit of a compassionate moment for myself, from myself. And I kind of nod and say, yeah, that was hard on you. You know, you hurt in that moment and it did tap into some of your past emotional mental health struggles. But then you watch the rest of the episodes and we come back in and like, episodes six and eight and nine and 10. And you start to see the reality of how I rebounded and how I helped my team and, and how I handled some difficult situations that a lot of racers were really struggling in with like ingenuity and creativity and helpfulness. And so then you're like, oh, that's her. There she is. She's right there. She's always right there. So I think if anything, the show kind of gave me the perspective when we're talking about depression. When you're in it, there can be a lot of shame and it can be really hard to bounce out of. But most people do bounce out of it. It is a kind of ebb and flow thing to a lot of people's lives who shine really brightly, also dim really low. And that can be an uncomfortable way to live your life, depending on how you think about that process in your brain. So if there's more acceptance, more embracing, more tender, loving care for the times when your light is really low and more introspection on what you need to do to get your light brightened. I think that's the journey of someone like me who will battle with depression, but then also clearly go on to be really helpful and a really bright, shining light. Mm, that's really, really good. I resonate so much because I, I do get that feedback a lot. It's like, oh my God, Olivia, you're so bright. You're so airy all the time, yep. but not all the time. <laughs> Behind closed doors, I do have to dim that light. And part of it is relaxation, but the other part of it is fatigue and being depleted and learning how to fill my cup back up, learning how to exactly. make the light shine again. Those are things that I'm still on the journey of trying to figure that out. And maybe it's a never ending journey, but I, I think we're always evolving along yeah. this journey. We're, the, our life experiences are what are teaching us in those moments. And again, the hard bits that come for us, like they're meant for us. Mm. We just have to take that as like, oh, okay, another hard bit here. There's something for me to learn. Let's progress through it. Let's be compassionate with ourselves. It's not easy, yeah. but it is meant for us. Did you ever hop into therapy? Yes. Not- I had a full panic attack, mental breakdown, shattering. My husband closed my business. I laid in bed for four months. He got me a, like a little new iPhone and put two phone numbers in it, my daughter and him. And I didn't look at my computer or my iPhone for four months. And because I was just really broken from the failure of everything and everything I've been numbing from the other parts of my life that needed attention. Yeah, I got into therapy. I think I went to therapy for probably a solid month, three times a week because I wasn't super stable. Yeah. I was having a lot of like suicidal ideation and which is that next level after depression. When depression, depression is a coping mechanism. So when depression isn't coping anymore, then we start to go to that next level. Mm -hmm. And so I needed help and I have a daughter and husband, so I need to be safe and they need to be safe. Everyone needs to be safe. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was lucky that we found a great person to help me and we did three times a week and then we went to two and then we went to one. And then, you know, there was a definite journey there. And I remember thinking, why is this so hard? Why is this taking so long? Where's the silver lining? All of those things. And it just is what it is. It's going to take what it's going to take. And looking at it now, three and a half years later, I can say, oh, I know the silver lining. And oh, I've bounced back. And oh, I'm, I manage things and I have tools and I can look back now. But I remember even being like a year and a half in and thinking, I guess this is just my life now. I don't think I'm ever going to get the silver lining. But it does come if you commit to the work and you kind of get over that your life is going to be what it was before or it's going to be some new fantastic thing. You meet it where it's at. And then eventually you're going to look back and go, okay, we, we actually, we're doing real good now. Yeah. I know. I remember some days in therapy, I was like, I, this is just never going to get better. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't yeah. understand, but that's part of the work, right? It is. It's a really uncomfortable part too. It's so uncomfy. It's so mm-hmm. uncomfy, but we're always changing. That's how life yep. that's how life gives you those amazing moments where you do get to the other side and you do get to experience the full beauty. And that's what I keep emphasizing on this podcast is if you are in, in one of those moments where you do feel like your bowl is empty or yeah. at a moment where 
things just seem uncomfy and you're at a crossroads in your life, go talk to someone, lean on yep. people because there are tools out there that yeah. I had no idea existed. We don't get this when we're like, they don't teach us in school. No, <laughs> never. And everyone's journey is different. It really is. So it's not like there is a prescription for how to navigate this for yourself. But we do have a stigma about it, and it is a very, it can be a very isolating experience. You can feel like you should just hold it inside and not talk to anyone and not tell anyone. And then that breeds more stigma and less people talk out. So the more we have these chats and we just say, yo, hey, this is what it was for me. It's going to be different for you, but I just want you to know there's a journey out there that you can go on and it can get better. 100%. What's next for you? Oh, what is next? I mean, you know, 14 year old navigating COVID, like, <laughs> oh, <challenge>. God. <laughs> I know I, parts of me, I wake up and I feel like I try to forget everything that's going on in the world, but then it's just yeah. like, nope, you can't. I will say when COVID hit, it was very interesting to watch the collective nation have the same feelings and sensations as I had when I had my breakdown. I remember being like, oh, I know this. I've been here, yo. Like, I got this. I can help you. I, I felt oddly prepared for COVID because now the nation was sort of going through what I had gone through in a more isolated way. But next for me, so I came home from the, the world's toughest race and there were 330 athletes in the race, 66 teams. And the one thing I knew flying home from Fiji was that all these stories were not going to get told. I have yet to have a podcast where somebody didn't have some knowledge bomb, truth bomb, way to look at things really differently. And that's been my guiding light over the last couple of months, just these lovely conversations. Oh, what a gift. So you need to go listen to that podcast after you listen to this podcast. Get all yeah. the podcasting you need right here, ladies and gents. What I keep coming back to as well with this podcast, this is the second season. And the more I talk to people, all walks of life, all experiences, every person has a hardship they've been through and they've overcome it. And it's actually almost like amped them up and made them brighter and made them shine brighter. And it's led them to actually their true calling and their purpose. Storytelling is really important, really powerful. Yep. Yay. Well, we're going to end with a fun lightning round for people to get to know you a little bit better. So this is called Finish the Sentence. So I'll say the first part and then you can okay. think about it and then complete it. Okay. I have seen every episode of House. I cannot leave my house without my fanny pack. Love me a good fanny pack moment. <laughs> my favorite meal is like tuna, avocado, tomatoes, bell peppers with some like honey mustard dressing. Yum. Each day I get older, I realize that my daughter is my teacher. Mm, love that. On days I don't feel like pushing myself, I rejuvenate, 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 go in the hot tub, paint my nails, meditate, lay in bed, journal, take care of myself. Mm. Something I would tell my 21-year-old self is? Just have the drink. It's fine. You'll be fine. Live it up. I get that so often. Just chill. Like, you're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about it. Get drunk. It's fine. Yeah. My motto is? My motto is live for adventure. Mm, love that. And then the last one, someone wise once told me that everything I wanted would come if I just believed in myself. Mm, preach. Preach, sister. Oh my goodness. Well, Sonia, thank you so much for talking about your journey. Everybody go check out her podcast. Tales of Toughness. Go watch Ego Challenge Fiji, Amazon Prime, 10 episodes. You will be so inspired. Well, thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you. All right. Take care.